Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. In this episode, Simon Brown, author of Software Architecture for Developers, interviews Owen Woods, CTO of Indava, and co-author of the recently released Continuous Architecture in Practice. They explore the right and best way to set the basis of your software architecture, key things to consider, and some useful resources. Created for developers, by developers, GoTo gathers the best minds in the software community. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in Chicago, Amsterdam, and Copenhagen, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Okay, welcome folks. Uh, so my name is Simon Brown. I'm an, an independent consultant specializing in software architecture. I'm the author of uh, a couple of software architecture books. Joining me today is Owen Woods, who's author of another bunch of software architecture books. Uh, Owen, do you just want to introduce yourself quickly? Thanks, Simon. Hello, I'm Owen Woods. Uh, I'm the CTO of a company called Indava, and uh, Simon and I have known each other for a while. One of the reasons being we've both written some software architecture books. <laughs> so I've written a couple, one called Software Systems Architecture with my good friend Nick Rosensky, and one more recently with Murat Erder and Pierre Pura, which is on um, continuous architecture. It's the second of uh, two books on continuous architecture. This one's called Continuous Architecture in Practice. Awesome. And we and we shall get into the title of that book a little bit later on. So I, I remember reading certainly the second edition of Software Systems Architecture. Uh, probably, when was it released? Uh, the second edition, I think, was 20, 2005? Hmm, yeah. Well, maybe yeah, it was, I was, I was I'm actually getting lost myself. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was the latter half of the early 2000s, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. So I, I remember reading that at the time, and uh, that was kind of just after the Agile movement came around, uh, but just on the tail end of the waterfall RUP UML sort of movement. And I remember being a big fan of the book, still am a big fan of the book. It's, it's on my recommend, uh, recommendations list. It's a book about two things though, right? It's a book about architecture uh, and processes and things. And it's a book about documentation. And both of these topics have been, let's say, shunned over the past decade or two decades. What are your thoughts on that? And, and is the book still relevant for today's audience? That's such a great question. Yes, it was a funny time to be writing the book because it has its roots right back in the early 2000s when I was working in Silicon Valley and Nick was working as a uh, an architect in the UK, mainly on big finance projects. And yeah, we were both realising definitely waterfall wasn't the answer. That had not been the answer for some time and probably never was. RUP was quite mainstream, but RUP was starting to get sort of almost undermined by a sort of tools selling process and it was becoming quite waterfall it was becoming very document centric and we realized that um really we had to some, try, somehow try and write a book that was that was relevant to people who were going to do a lot of big design up front as it used to be called but also we wanted to stress the fact that if you're going to do big design up front it had to be valuable and that was something that seemed seemed to be to us seemed to be getting lost at that time people were just producing documents because they were told to produce documents. So, so that was really part of the inspiration for the book was um, we both believe in capturing things. Nick calls it writing stuff down. I mean, I, I prefer just capturing because there's all kinds of ways you capture information. It's about having the information, but for goodness sake, make it valuable. And so I think the book's a little bit uh, context dependent. It, it, it's very much the book of its age as the world was moving between these two worlds. But in terms of more recently, um, I think we've had this conversation a few times. I mean, there's a tendency to go agile, I don't write anything down. That's not what the manifesto says. It's not what any leading practitioner says. It's not what any successful agile team has ever done, but somehow it gets interpreted in that way. Just the same way RUP used to be, RUP's got all these possible documents I, sh I can write, I'm gonna write them all. So for some reason, people often take a pretty simplistic view of an approach. And unfortunately that doesn't normally end up being successful. So I think that's why the book stayed at least somewhat relevant, was still selling copies, which is really nice, and people are still referring to it, and people are still getting value from it, because there's a lot of what's in it. Actually, we had to straddle the two worlds, so I hope it's pretty pragmatic, and it emphasises doing useful things rather than doing things for the sake of doing things. It's also used in a bunch of universities and courses, I believe. 
Is that right? It is used quite a lot in academia. That was a great surprise to us. We wrote the first edition. We had no uh, no ambition at all of reaching academia, completely written for people developing systems every day, because that's what we did. And then when the first edition was out, we got quite a few email messages from academics saying, could we have the slides, please? Or could we have the worked examples? We went, well, we haven't got either of those. Why did you think we would? And they said, well, it's really useful for teaching. We use it all the time. And the normal protocol is if you want us to use it for teaching, you write the slides. Well, we didn't ever write the slides, but luckily <laughs> they kept on using it. And actually now we still get approaches from master students who are using it uh, as your know, inspiration for a thesis or it's being used on, in some teaching. So I think again, it is about straddling the two worlds. I have more of an academic background than Nick. Nick's got a really practical industrial background. And so we were able to bring both of those things to bear. So the book is relevant to practitioners. We're still selling there and they're our primary market. But actually lots of academics who want to prepare students for real industrial work are sort of seeing it as a kind of pragmatic text, but it's founded in some quite sound academic principles. Yeah, that's that's really why I look like and still recommend the book today. It's because... If you look at some of the, uh, let's say, older software architecture books, uh, some of those are very theoretical, very dry and very kind of academic focused. Uh, but your book has that nice mixer too. There's there's lots of theory there, but you also describe how to kind of do it in the real world, which I, I, I think at the time it came out, that was something that was really kind of missing uh, in, in those sorts of texts. The subtitle of the book, Viewpoints and Perspectives, what's that about? <laughs> yes, so uh, that's really where we started. We nearly called the book Viewpoints and Perspectives. And I think we talked to, to a professional in the publishing industry who looked at us with horror and said, goodness sake, no, tell them what the book's about. Um, so Viewpoints is really where we started. Um, I discovered this thing called Viewpoints when I was working in Silicon Valley because I had a real software architecture problem. I was working as the software architect for a new software product line and we needed to describe it. We needed to write down the fundamental principles of how, how it hung together. And I, like most people, started drawing boxes and lines and put, you know, I had some information on there and a bit of how we would deploy it and a bit of software structure. And nobody really understood it. And then I came across this paper, the four plus one paper, as it's known by Philippe Crook. Uh, and that really started my personal journey into some meaningful um, you know, um, kind of relationship with software architecture. Because Philippe's paper points out that there isn't one architectural structure. There are many architectural structures. He indicated four. We actually started there. We actually started using those structures. Nick and I started using those in our everyday work. We came across a few limitations. Like Nick was do doing a lot of systems with a lot of data in them. So he needed an, an information data type view and there wasn't one of those. Uh, and when we, when we came to using products and dealing with um, software products that, that were in operation, there was nothing in Philippe's set to talk to the people in operation, uh, the, the operations group about. So, so we started extending it a bit. And then as we thought about it a bit more, we realised one of the things that software architects need to obsess about, which you talk about a lot in your work too, is system qualities, quality attributes, so performance and scalability and resilience and security and all those things. And we started thinking about creating a security view, and then we'd need a performance view, and we'd probably need a but back then we called it a high availability view and so on. And our views were exploding. And we realized that when we actually came to do it for real, we actually tried this, we were duplicating lots and lots of information between the views. And that's when it sort of hit us. Actually, you don't create a view for security. Security is something that all of your views need to be affected by. So that's why we said, don't create a security view. Here's the advice on how to think about security in the context of your other views. And so views, a view is a way of describing one aspect of a software system, one kind of coherent structure. So this is its functional structure, how you're going to deploy it, how you're going to operate it, and so on. And they're normally written for one particular group of people who care, that's in the jargon, the stakeholders. So that's who cares about the functional structure? Well, not the operations people. They really, really don't care. They care a lot about what's going to go wrong how to monitor it and how to pick it back off the floor when it's gone wrong. So it's a very different set of concerns. So each view addresses some of those people. And then once you've got a candidate system, the perspectives are about how you think about these cross-cutting concerns, as we call them, like security, performance, scalability. How do you revisit each of those kinds of structure and think about the impact that meeting that software quality, that quality attribute is going to have on that structure? So that's how we came up with 
viewpoints and perspectives. It'd be fair to say that viewpoint, our set of viewpoints has had quite a lot of impact. It's cited quite a lot. Perspectives, considerably less so. <laughs> Some people, quite a lot of people know about perspectives. Not that many people have picked up the idea. Though in the academic literature, there are probably two, three, maybe four new perspectives have been added by, by software architectural researchers. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? People, if you ask them to think about like a, a software architecture document template, they'll be able to list, list out the various sections that, that they think they might want to cover in their documentation set. Mm -hmm. But very few people, it seems, have heard of something like 4 plus 1, which, of course, is, is the essence of all of that stuff. It's, it's, let's look at that software system from different angles. One of the big additions you made in addition to of your book, and I know we've spoken about this before, was the context. Yes. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes, well, that's, that is actually quite interesting. So that was a bout of idealism in the first book. Um, we said, well, clearly there'll be people who already have vision for this system. And we didn't call them product owners. I think we called them acquirers. They're, they're the people who really know what the system's going to have to do. And there'll probably be business analysts involved. And it'll be very obvious what the boundary of the system is. And then, well, we realized after a while that when we look back at our real experience, that was almost never true. And when there was some idea about the context, it was always wrong because people hadn't actually thought through the technical implications of where the system boundary was. And so when we came to the second edition, we just thought, no, this isn't credible, is it? We're going to have to add a context view because we nearly always end up doing a context thing. It's just we often it's outside the architectural description. We should just include it in the architectural description. It's so much neater and cleaner. And if there's something pre-existing, well, you can always inherit it and evolve it a bit further but i'm afraid we were just a bit optimistic and kind of ignored practical experience at that point <laughs> yeah the number of architecture documents i've read in the past where you kind of get through the first 10 20 30 pages and it all goes into like very technical details very quickly and you, you kind of left wondering what is this thing and, and who's using it and and why are we actually building it and all of that context you say is kind of missing so yeah i i really like the way that was embedded into the uh view, viewpoints and perspectives Okay. That, that you and together. That's a great point is that one of the key things about any deliverable, any artifact you create is you need to think about who's going to use it and what are they going to use it for? Because otherwise, as you suggest, you just end up writing pages and pages and pages that may or may not be of any use to anyone. And they, they just become really sort of technical debt immediately. They, they just become a liability because they, they become out of date very quickly or in fact, they completely misrepresent how the system really works. Which leads me to my next question. So one of the things I see a lot of people talking about at the moment is what should our minimum package of software architecture documentation be? What are your thoughts on that question? You know, teams who have nothing now and are looking to create something. Yeah, I think it's terribly context dependent. I always start really from who cares. And the, as we said, the jargon word for that is your stakeholders. But they're just, they're the people who care. And some people care in a very positive way and they want your system and they want it to be a success and they try to cheering you on. And some people, frankly, may be at best rather indifferent as to whether your system is successful or may want it killed at birth because it's in some way causes them a problem. But they all have a view and they've all got influence. And I think we're trying to serve those people. I mean, some of them are obvious. The development team, the development organisation that the architect's in, they are very obviously major stakeholders in an architecture. I mean, it affects them directly. They, they're part of creating it. They're part of, part of evolving it. Um, some people like end users are pretty obvious. They maybe don't understand quite how the architecture works, but they may need a lot of consideration during it. You've got people like the operations group. We talked about infrastructure. There's various groups who, who may want to know. And then there's some people who aren't obvious at all, at least when you start out, like compliance in a bank. I mean, who would have thought you'd have to have a software architecture view for compliance? Actually, as I discovered many times, if you ignore compliance until the last minute, you're just not going live. There's no negotiation. They don't care how much money you've been spent. You're just not going live. So actually, it's really important to have some kind of um, architectural artifact that addresses them. So that's where I start is who cares? And in most cases, the people who care are the people who have to build it, the people who have to operate it, and the people who have to um, sit in between those two worlds. I hate the term DevOps people because I don't think there's any such thing. I think DevOps is something everyone does together. But, but think of them as the people who are maybe infrastructure designers, application management experts, and so on. Those groups are probably the minimal set. If you can't explain 
what the structure of the system is and what are the guiding principles of how to evolve it. If you can't explain where it's going to run, how it's going to run, what it needs, and if you can't explain how to operate it, you're probably in a bad place. And then the other group who don't always want to know, but they quite often want to know, are the people paying for it. So we call them the acquirers. You might, they might be the, the product group, those kind of people. Then some of them are very hands-off, I found, about architecture. It's really just make magic happen, I trust you. But in many cases, then, of course, if something goes wrong, then they want to know why they didn't know. So actually, the people who are responsible for shaping the funding and the functional um, trained features going into it and who are maybe accountable for the business results, it's important to have some sort of architectural description for them so they understand all the trade-offs you've made. Because whether they understand them or really care, those trade-offs actually have a big impact on the potential success of their business. So it is important that something caters to them, whether it's unlikely to be the same architectural description that you and I would like to sit with the dev team and kind of debate for hours, but they do need something that explains what those trade-offs are. Yeah. Previously, we've heard lots of people say, you don't need to write documentation because you should write self-documenting code, uh, clean code. Um, and there's this there's been this big kind of anti-documentation movement over the years. And I think if there's one benefit potentially that's come out of this COVID thing, it's that teams have realized that, oh, everybody's not in the office anymore. They can't have those conversations as easily as they were before. And we've not written anything down. So, oops, maybe we should start doing something. So I think from my perspective, that's why I'm seeing a lot more teams figuring out how do we do documentation. So, so that, that kind of brings me back, back, back to my initial question about, how relevant do you think your book is in today's world? And, and I think it's hugely relevant. That's good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I mean, the thing about architecture and code is really interesting. So we have a mutual friend, George Fairbanks, who in his book, Just Enough Software Architecture, which is aimed very much at teams, he talks about this idea of architecturally evident coding. And I mean, it's a really simple idea, but quite often you don't end up with it. I mean, what all George is saying is, if you've got an architectural concept, I should be able to go to IntelliJ, assuming I'm using Java, and search for that name, and I should find it. And I should find it in the right place with the right features and functions that it, you know, expect from the whiteboard sketch. And that's true. The problem is, is that the programming languages we've got today, and to some extent the frameworks, they don't actually make the architectural structures very obvious. A lot of architecture, by the time you get into the code, it's really convention. And the problem with convention is you've got to infer it, you can misunderstand it, and sometimes people completely ignore it. So that's why even if the architectural description is a little bit idealistic, where it's not always followed and it doesn't quite match, I think knowing what the key abstractions in the head of the person or the people who put it together and actually what, how they thought the system should work, that's tremendously valuable five years later when you're 500,000 lines of code in and you need to make a change and you can't really understand why changing it in one place seems to have this ripple effect you, you just didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, it's super essential and I think a lot of teams have not got to that point yet. So I see uh, younger, less mature teams from an engineering perspective, uh, perspective they're the sort of teams that typically shun documentation. And, and you're right, maybe in two, three, four, five years, they, they might realize, oh, perhaps we should have written some stuff down because we forgot it. And I guess that's why things like architecture decision records are, are becoming much more popular because now we, we can record that set of uh, decisions that ultimately got, got us to where we are today. Yeah, I think that's very much actually how teams, if they don't want to produce lots of pictures, if you like, or models, ideally, yeah, if you can capture your the style that you think the thing has, as in... Well, what kind of patterns are you using? Could you capture your decisions? That will be so valuable in two or three years' time, the yeah. rationale for those decisions. Yeah. It's not a new idea. I mean, we've been capturing decisions, even checking them into the code for decades, but rel again, relatively few teams do it. And it's really good to see it now becoming quite popular again. One of the things I think put people off documentation was UML. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on UML? <laughs> Today in 2021. <laughs> yes, it did. So some years ago, was it 2017? You and I did a, did a joint <laughs> conference talk on UML, didn't we? We that did. Was great. Yeah. That was great fun. Um, so my thoughts on UML today are that I, I, I've been an advocate for UML for quite a long time. 
and uh, I'm well known. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm known in the UML community for not being very keen on UML. And I'm known outside the UML community for being an absolute pro UML bigot. So I've I've clearly offended both groups quite effectively. <laughs> Good work. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a gift. <laughs> um, certainly, I have found a lot of value using UML over the years, as I explained in that conference talk, which is still knocking around, and I've I think I've documented many times. I used to joke. Um, it's kind of the worst architectural description language apart from all the others. Um, and that for certain kinds of architectural documentation, UML has been very valuable. However, I was always qualifying that and saying it's very valuable providing you're building a model, as in something that's, that's real data as opposed to just drawing some pictures. Secondly, is that the people you're um, talking to understand it. And thirdly, that you tailor UML enough to make it specific so you actually know what a particular kind of box on a diagram actually means. It's got some relation to the real world. You don't just sprinkle UML generic components all over the place because no one knows what you mean then and you'll probably forget. Um, so with all those qualifiers, I have to say that it's becoming increasingly difficult in 2021 to see why most mainstream teams would use UML. There are relatively few people, for better or worse, the reality is there are relatively few mid-career engineers today are fluent in UML and tailoring UML. Relatively few teams have access to good UML tooling. And when you just go around the software industry in general, <clears throat> you don't find fluency with it or uh, any, uh, any sort of natural affinity with it, which allows people to understand it quickly. So actually, if you're not careful, using UML sort of defiantly today can just become a barrier to communication. Yeah. The, the lessons from UML though, which I think one of the great things about your book, you keep on reiterating these simple points, but you, you make it really clearly is you make sure that you know what the what the style you're working in is. Make sure you know what your building blocks are, what they mean. Make sure that you, you're very consistent in your diagrams. Make sure you've got a key so that somebody can look at the diagram and quickly pick up. Why have you used the dashed arrow there? I come across so many diagrams, just like the ones that you you, you kindly parody in, in, in some of your talks, where you know they, they've used four different arrow styles and there's no key. And I've no idea whether they just got bored of one arrow style and thought it would be visually pleasing to use a different one, or it's critically important and I have to understand that's a different thing. And it just it, it, it just devalues so much of the good work they've done to try and think out how their architecture works. So yeah, much as I perhaps it grieves me to say it, uh, I think today it's quite difficult to see where UML fits in mainstream software development practice outside specialized environments where they've got lots of tooling, it's very well understood. They can do co-generation of it, you know, in, in, you know, in a very, you know, where that's actually valuable. And there are domains that, that that's true in, but for a lot of us, that's probably no longer the case. Yeah, I I mostly see the same sorts of things. Um, so UML is big in regulated environments, automotive, you know, the sort of um, those sorts of more precision-based engineering environments. Um, if you go to Reddit, UML dies every week. <laughs> I mean, there, there was a there was a blog post last week that says UML is dead again. Um, yeah, it's it's a tough sell, isn't it? I mean, it's just a notation. Ultimately, it's just a bunch of boxes and lines, and, and people can use it however they want to. But even even suggesting teams use UML for drawing diagrams, like no, that's not for us. And it's just a, a instant knee jerk reaction, probably based on fashion. Yeah, but strangely, the thing that I've seen a lot more of recently is Archimate which for years and years struggled to make itself heard in the din of no documentation versus UML. Now, somehow, it seems to have poked its head back up. And <laughs> I've seen more Archimate in the last two years than I did in the previous five, which, again, surprises yeah. me because yeah, same here. actually you need to understand the notation. You don't need to understand the semantics. You probably need to have some kind of a tool. Um, but actually, it seems to be popping back up. So, so, yeah, as you say, these things come and go. Maybe UML will have a third age. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? One of the things you said, and, and this comes back to your viewpoints and perspectives approach, is if you've got, say, a, a bunch of structural diagrams and then you want a security perspective and a, a performance perspective, how do you keep all this stuff in sync? You mentioned modeling, didn't you? It is actually really difficult without a model. And that's, I mean, that, that was one of the reasons that I found great value when I was doing architecture for, in large finance environments. They were big and complicated. And honestly, when you'd understood something and you wanted to capture it at architecture level, either system of systems, so EA level, or within a complicated system, you wanted to keep that, that knowledge safe. And also you wanted to reuse that knowledge in PowerPoint, 
extract it into Excel. You wanted to be able to use it maybe to you know, generate something something from it. Um, so actually, that was the value of the model was that once you'd captured the knowledge as a model, you could then you could generate different diagrams very quickly and just modify colors and shape and position, that sort of thing. And then when you change the name here, it would change everywhere and so on. Honestly, today, I think people generally aren't creating models. Um, if they're not creating by model, of course, I mean, you know, a data driven representation of their system from which they can create diagrams. If they haven't got a model, the advice has to be to keep it as simple and minimal as possible, but also to be very aware that consistency is no longer guaranteed. <clears throat> so when a name is different from one diagram to another diagram, you can pretty safely assume that something has changed and you should go and sync your reality with the code because for whatever reason, some thinking has moved on and something has changed. And I don't, unless people are happy to go back to creating models, and I don't sense that outside creating the DDD type models in code, I don't sense a great enthusiasm for creating models outside the code itself. Um, I mean, even Structurizer you know, hasn't become an industry standard. Of course, it's your approach to how you use the code as the base and then very cleverly you, you then use code structures to represent more abstract structures around it. And that, you know, it, it's been successful, it's, it's well known, but you don't go into every software engineering center and see structurizer in use. Uh, um, uh, a great tragedy for you personally, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, much as we would promote it, I mean, structurizer is a great approach, uses the, the advantages of code with some of the abilities of models to create um, architectural descriptions. And that will, of course, keep everything in, in sync. And as you compile it, it'll quickly point out you've got something wrong. But I just don't see huge enthusiasm for it. So the advice has to be keep it as simple and minimal as possible and make sure that you actually spend a bit of time and effort curating whatever descriptions you've got. Because the longer you leave them without any editing and curation, the less valuable they're going to be. Yeah, it's a it's it's a really hard sell to get people off diagramming and into modeling. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's there's a very negative association just with the word modeling. Modeling sounds like one of those things we used to do with rational unified process and UML and big design at front, and that was something we threw away in the early two thousands. And of course, it is fairly straightforward to take a nice lightweight approach to building a model, and then you can surface different viewpoints and perspectives off that. But there's some effort involved in, in having in creating that model, right? Absolutely. And it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell. Um, lots of people I see are big into creating diagrams as text with Mermaid and Plant UML and things like that. And they'll create multiple versions for multiple different views of, of the same information, essentially, but they're still not willing to go that next step and kind of converge everything in, into a, a single definition. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll get there one day. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe we need to get better at identifying tangible benefits or explaining them better. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, what I find quite funny is when I run my workshops, I explicitly point out that now you've drawn two different pictures of essentially the same thing at two different levels of abstraction. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a tool that when you renamed this thing here, this thing here changed? They're like, oh, that would be awesome. You should build that. I'm like, I have done, but it's a hard sell. <laughs> All you have to do now is use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we've covered quite a lot of stuff for software systems architecture. Mm -hmm. So moving on to um, continuous architecture in practice. Mm -hmm. Lots of people will probably be familiar with the term evolutionary architecture. Mm -hmm. What's different about continuous architecture? Um, I think so. The so evolutionary architecture and continuous architecture, I, I'd say, are related. But I, uh, I would suggest evolutionary architecture is a looser idea, and it's it's more a set of techniques, patterns, practices to help you create an architecture that is possibly evolvable. Continuous architecture is an approach that Murat and Pierre, again, based on the long, long period of you know, industrial practice, they kept finding that um, they, you know, they had to react to agility when it arrived and they saw continuous delivery arriving and they saw DevOps arriving and they saw more and more of their colleagues just couldn't relate their architecture work to working in this modern world where you had lots of stuff happening in parallel because micro or not, people were doing service-based computing. So they want teams were more autonomous. They didn't react very well to the fact that people wanted less design up front because they recognized they knew less. They wanted to learn more through the process. They would take more risk. They didn't really um, 
they weren't very interested, perhaps, to be honest, in dealing with the ops group and all the messy details and awkwardness of production operations. They just wanted to sort of set the big blueprint. And Mer and Pierre, had, you know, they, they've known each other a long time, but were working in very different environments. Um, they just stayed in touch, like Nick, Nick, Nick and I had. Um, and they, they were both talking about this and they were evolving their practice. And then um, I suppose, was it seven or eight years ago now, they said, you know, we don't see anyone else who's really explained how to do this. Maybe we should just write it down. So they wrote their first book, Continuous Architecture. And they identified some principles to help you think about the fact that architecture is an activity, but it's not an activity that has to be done by one person, all up front, done once and then abandoned. And continuous architecture is turning that on its head. And it's saying architecture is a team game. The entire team, or as many people in the team as possible, should feel part of it. Of course, you know, some people will lead more, some people will follow more, but people feel ownership of it. And it happens right through the life cycle because the further we go through the life cycle, the more we know. So therefore, th there's been this idea of deferring your architectural decisions for quite a long time, but not really too much advice on how you might go about doing that or how you might think about structuring the architecture work to support that. So that's what continuous architecture is all about. It's about doing architecture all the time, a small amount in every sprint, um, making sure that you're thinking about build, test, deploy, operate, as well as just build. Um, it, it's about making sure that you shape teams, you know, that, so that they, that they fit in with the, the structure of the system that you want. It's about thinking about um, the fact that in, um, if you build more smaller things, then you get more parallelism, autonomy, you get more ability to change at a cost of more complexity. It's about thinking about that trade-off, not always just going microservices. It's about thinking, what granularity do I need? But, the, but you know, there is power in small. It's recognizing that. And so I came across, so I met Murat first. Uh, we met through an industry event and we got chatting and we were both working for big banks at the time. We had a lot in common, many of the same pain points, both <laughs> working as architects on similar projects. Um, I read their book and I thought I'd, some years before, uh, uh, before their book, but certainly before I'd known them, I created a conference talk on um, agile software architecture. And that was based on my experience at a big bank, working with agile teams on how architects could be really valuable to agile teams and not just like this awkward Mr. Say No who gets in the way, but could actually make the agile teams better. And that had been quite successful. And you know, I talk, gave that talk five, six times and then sort of forgot about it, really. I think I wrote, wrote an article or two and then it just kind of, it was just there. They hadn't seen that. But when I read their book, I thought, well, this is all very similar. And I got talking to Murat and then I met Pierre uh, at, at, um, at, at another conference. And we just got talking that their first book they liked, but they felt it wasn't really practical enough. A lot of people had immediately contacted them and said, I sort of get all these principles, but I'm not quite sure what I actually do. And they have a process, but the process doesn't, the process more tells you how to structure your work, because that was the goal. It was about, we know, you, the assumption is you know what you're doing, what you need is help in rethinking about how you go about the work, not how to do the work. So that then led them to think about a second edition. Uh, and they contacted me and we talked about, um, you know, how they might go about that. And uh, in fact, change publisher at the time. And the second publisher suggested maybe given Owen's got some very specific knowledge and interest in some of these qualities, maybe he, he should join. So the three of us came together and reformed the book a bit. And that's how the second edition came around. It was, we've got to take a step beyond assuming that all the knowledge is there and that all we have to do is nudge people in the right direction to rethink how they engage with the team. Maybe we should be giving them actually just pragmatic, practical advice based on the fact that all three of us have built a load of big systems on when we say you should do security continuously. Okay. Well, where would I start exactly? Uh, Cause the security team turned up and told me to do it all at the very beginning or all at the very end. But so how do I change that? So, so we have chapters on security and resilience and performance and scalability. We've got one on data, which is big sticking point. Cause of course data tends to be one of those things that either makes a system really easy to change or really hard to change depending on some of, often quite early decisions. Um, and Pierre was also in, uh, Pierre's just retired actually after a uh, long rather distinguished career at Travelers. And um, when um, he was working there his last couple of years, he actually stepped out of day-to-day -day architecture and went to look at innovation because they wanted to make innovation far more impactful. And one of the things they noticed was that it often didn't fit with how, they, how things actually worked in their real systems. So Pierre worked on how do architects work with people doing innovation projects so they don't just create 
isolated PLCs that are cute to have, but will actually be immediately usable with the mainstream enterprise platforms. So he had quite a few insights on that. So we also put a chapter in on how, how as a continuous architect, you can be continually working with these fast moving innovation groups because these new continuous, this new approach to architecture is very relevant to them because again, they'd never engaged before. Because <clears throat> they say, by the time you guys have drawn your pictures and waffled a bit, we'll be done. We're only doing this for three months, see it. Whereas, you know, architects that are used to working in two week cycles, suddenly they talk a, a much closer shared language. So that was another thing we, we put into the book. So, uh, and at the start, it, it recaps the whole continuous architecture idea. So we hope it's going to bring some practical, useful guidance to people who are thinking, I'm a tech lead. I definitely don't want to be one of those PowerPoint kind of architects. I want to be with the team every sprint doing useful stuff. It's help them think about how do I structure that work so I don't get caught up in the kind of EA PowerPoint upfront conundrum. But also when they say, how do you do performance up continually as opposed to upfront or at the end, what would I do? So there's some kind of practical chapters to kind of just get them thinking about the key qualities. They won't be the same for every system, of course, but we find that some of those key qualities are important in most systems. So the book's out in, I think, August this year. Is that right? Uh, quite soon, yes. In some time. Um, final proofs are done. Uh, apparently yeah. it's going to the printers in June. So, yeah, sometime over the summer. And I've I've read a copy because you, you sent me a copy a couple of months ago to read as a kind of pre-review. And Thank you very much. Yes. No problem. You're welcome. I really enjoyed the book. The thing I do like about the book is that you do, uh, as you just said, you do focus on those trade-offs. So you'll say, here's a performance characteristic. Here's a system design. This, these are the various ways we can tackle it. And these are the, the characteristics of the design approaches and also the trade-offs that we're making here. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing I really like about the book. It's, it's, it's not like do everything the same way. It's very context specific. And you kind of point people to think about the decisions they're making and, and really consider the trade-offs. And, and that, I think, is something I see a lot of teams not doing these days. They're just rushing in. They're being very fashion-driven. Are oh, we going to go serverless or microservices? They're jumping on that distributed architecture bandwagon. And then three years later, guess what? They've got this horrible, brittle, messy thing, which is uh, really, really slow. The first chapter of the book, let me just read it. It's, um, it, it's, it has a, a subtitle called um, Why Software Architecture is More Important Than Ever. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Because this this book seems like a reaction to the whole Agile thing in, yes, in some senses. It's not an explicit reaction against Agile in any way. It's just trying to recouch why doing architecture as opposed to drawing pictures is actually really important in an Agile context. It sort of never went away. Um, and our point is, if you're going to try and move really fast, change your system all the time, have loads of parallel op- activity going from all of your different service teams, pushing stuff into production every couple of days, you better have a pretty good architecture to support that. Because people kind of glance at the hyperscalers and go, well, they do it. I mean, I lose track of the number of times I've talked to a client who, who, who wants to do something, dare I say it, slightly balmy. They go, well, I, I read, this is what Google do. I stop and go, yes. And how much do you think of investing? And of course, it's always a very, very small amount of time. Well, Google invests a thousand times that you know, every year. So you're possibly in a slightly different environment to them. So what we were hoping to do was um, just sort of, we hope it's reiteration. We don't think it's some radical uh, you know, recouching of architecture, but it's more almost reminding people of how important good architecture is, how good architecture work is, how important the architecture of the system is, if you're going to achieve these really, really challenging internet style quality attributes about speed and performance and scale and all these things you're going to need good architecture so that's that's why we thought it was important completely agree and and one of the things i've been kind of banging on for years about is is teams need to create firm foundations if you want to move fast you need you need good structure you need to you think about these things because it doesn't happen on its own and 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 that's how teams get lots uh, lots of technical debt and they get messy code bases and they just get these systems that are really hard to uh, kind of look after maintain and enhance there's a fine line there, isn't there? There's a fine line between let's design all the good stuff up front uh, and put some really, really, what we think are firm foundations and, and let's just write code and kind of hope for the best and do the evolutionary architecture thing. One of the things you focus on in the book, and I really like this, is is that approach to shifting the architectural thinking and decisions left. But of course, there's that fine line between how much is too far left and, and, and when do we kind of 
uh, into the big design up front world. Thoughts on shifting left? Yes, it's a really good point, actually. Um, it's easy to misunderstand. We use the term shift left quite a lot to indicate that architecture type thinking, which is often, uh, we're talking about qualities and we're reacting to lots and lots of experience where people start worrying about performance once they're in final test of some huge six month release. Uh, what we're trying to point out is that, that all the quality attribute thinking needs to be pushed way, way back into the big sort of, not, not entirely at the front, but throughout the cycle. Um, it is easy, we realize now that we reread the book ourselves to think, to think what we mean is shift it all left into a big heap at the start. <laughs> That's not what we're saying. <laughs> what we mean is we, we're trying to smooth it left. We should have said smooth it left. We're trying to smooth it through the cycle so it's, it, it's kind of a constant thing. Um, there are some things that probably do need to be decided fairly early. But, um, uh, I mean, obvious things would be, um, what's the fundamental architectural style for our system? Are we going to be monolithic or are we going to be serverless? Those are such extremes. You're, you're going to have to have some idea about that quite early. Um, we do. Have, we don't talk a lot about it in the book. We allude to it a little bit. Of course, we also think basic sort of fundamental software engineering like clean code and software craftsmanship is really important because that keeps the code maintainable so that if you've got a lot of serverless functions, perhaps you will be able to recombine them. If you've got a monolith, you will be able to decompose it. That's important. But that was the idea of the shift left. And the balance, you're quite right, is quite a subtle one. And it's one that, honestly, it probably it's very context dependent. It definitely relies on a certain degree of experience. But it, it, it's about making the minimum number of <coughs> decisions up front and then spreading your architecture work such that and rather than pushing architecture out of the delivery lifecycle, seeing it as a thing that happens first, you, you have to have to put some stakes in the ground. You have to make some decisions. But as you go through your constant delivery lifecycle, having architecture work all the way through, because the, as we said before, the further you go, the more you know. The more you know, the better the decision is going to be. Yeah. I guess it's, it's about making teams think about the trade-offs and the consequences of the decisions they're either making now or the decisions that they're deferring. Because, of, of course, one of the things you hear a lot of Agile say is, well, let's defer everything. Let's not make any decisions until the last possible moment. And, of course, that sounds good. But the thing is, a lot of teams don't realize that that last responsible moment is actually really early. It, it you know, Like with your monolith uh, uh, microservices or, or serverless approach, that's something you do need to decide fairly early. Otherwise, you, you completely go down the wrong track. Yes, well, it's like the old joke in manufacturing engineering about uh, um, uh, just-in-time delivery. It's always just too late. Um, it's very easy when you're thinking about making your decision at the last responsible moment to discover the last responsible moment was was three weeks ago. <laughs> and I, um, it's funny, Sandra Mancuso and I, the leading light in software craftsmanship, is you know, a fantastic software engineer. We both worked at the same big bank at the same time. And it'd be fair to say that we got it, we get on really well, but we also we had plenty of heated disagreements about last responsible moment. And you know there is no easy way to spot it. Um, I think. My bias is probably maybe different to Sandra's. It's to err slightly earlier, but constantly as an architect or as a designer or as a tech lead, be thinking, how can I unwind this decision? What are the implications of making it? And the, I think one of the really important things to get through to teams, you say, we're, we're sort of trying to democratize the architecture here. We, we don't want an architect making all the decisions. It's a shared collective. However, that places responsibility on you. When you're making a decision that has a trade-off for other people, outside your, your kind of local responsibility boundary, you better think about the trade-offs for everyone else, as well as just worrying about your delivery date, the sprint. And that sort of changes the dynamic a bit and hopefully gets people to think about the overall system qualities as well as my system qualities for my service and getting to production. And of course, that loops back to your, your first book, because if you if you kind of encourage by which I mean force, uh, team members <laughs> to write this stuff down. The act of writing stuff down, I think, forces them to maybe think a bit harder, and then they might think a little bit harder about the trade-offs and the consequences to other team members. And perhaps they might feel a little bit more uh, responsible and accountable for those decisions. Yes, I think so. I mean, there's two great ways of finding out if you understand something, aren't there? One is you try and write it down thoroughly, and secondly, you try and teach it to someone else. So, so yes, if, if teams have to record their design decisions <clears throat> and explain them to other people, I think you will definitely end up with better design decisions. So what are your goals with the new book, Continuous Architecture and Practice? What are you hoping it achieves? 
what we're really hoping to do is to do uh, serve two audiences. One is practicing architects who are really experienced. They know what they're doing, but they've possibly been working on one system or an existing set of systems for quite a while in a particular style. And they can see the world changing around them. And they, they're starting to react to agility, DevOps, microservices, cloud-based computing. They're, they sort of understand it all in theory, but they've not yet made much of a step into that world. And we hope we're, we're going to share our experience to show how actually all of their skills are still very relevant. It's more about how they apply them, how they work with people, and understanding some of the technical dynamics that have changed. And then the other group we're hoping to serve is people who are, have come up natively in that world, but they're at that sort of team leader, they're a technical designer, they're a subsystem lead. They're ready to take that step to become architects or chief engineers or lead engineers, whatever they're called in their organization, they're going to take accountability for architectural decisions. And they might be thinking, there's parts of this I know really well. There's a scale I haven't dealt with. I'm not quite sure how to integrate my work outside my local team into the overall development organizations. And I've only worked with certain parts of this quality property mix. I've never had to think about this too deeply because more experienced people have generally guided me what are the steps I need to take? And I think the book can serve both those audiences. We really hope people are going to find it useful. It is based on experience. And of course, we've tried to base it on some really solid foundations as well. But um, we think it reflects the way that the industry is headed, the reality of today, and also a lot of experience that we've found as to what works and doesn't work. Yeah, agreed. From my perspective, when I read the version that you sent me, it's got a really nice breadth of content. So it's very comprehensive in terms of, you know, what it covers from an architect's perspective. And yeah, I I completely agree for, for people who are new to the role. It's a really nice, I'm going to say tick list, but it, it, you know, don't treat the book as a tick list, but it's a really nice list of topics that you should perhaps think about when you're when you're going through and making those architectural decisions. And, and the other thing I really like about it, as, as I said, is the, uh, the focus on the trade-offs, so so kind of explicitly telling people there is no single right answer. Don't don't try and find one. But the other thing I really like about the book is there are so many references to other material. You could just literally give that one book to 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 people, and and they could have a whole spider's web of of other books and knowledge and websites that they can go and and, and find information about. And and from that perspective, I think it's super useful for people who are new to the architecture role. So yeah, I hope I hope it does well. That's great to hear. Thank you. Definitely go buy it in the uh, summer. <laughs> Would be my message to people watching this. It's a great book. So I think we're done. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Simon. That was really fun. Where can people find more information about you and the book? Uh, you can find information about the book on continuousarchitecture.info and also .com. That's our website. Uh, more information about me, I have a website too, owenwoods.info. And uh, Pierre and Murat both have websites too, which are linked off the book's website. So plenty of stuff to go and read. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech for lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.